Superhero movies are without a doubt the most successful genre in film. They succeed in both entertaining audiences with spectacle that is often unmatched as well as taking money from our wallets, but I can't help but feel like there's something missing from most of the superhero movies that end up in top 10 lists. Obviously movies like The Dark Knight and Infinity War are incredible and deserve every bit of praise they get, but though they can intrigue me, amaze me, and entertain me, they don't really inspire me. None of them ever make me feel like I too could save the day in my own daily life and rise above my own challenges. They make me feel the opposite actually, like I'm helpless and I need someone who is stronger, smarter, funnier, and more attractive to save the day for me. And if it's not one person, then it's a whole freaking team of them. But what if there was a superhero movie where the hardest thing the hero had to do wasn't lifting something heavy or sacrificing themselves for half of all of life in the universe, but just figuring out what they really want in life? What if the hero wasn't a god or a billionaire, but actually someone dorky, average, and struggling to pay rent? I'm obviously talking about Spider-Man 2, and I know I'm nowhere near the first to talk about it, but it's one of those movies I hold really close to my heart. First, because of nostalgic reasons, second, because the film's themes and story is about something that I believe we can all relate to, and third, because the movie's a damn masterpiece. Pizza time. Released in 2004 and directed by Sam Raimi, Spider-Man 2 picks up where the first one left off and follows the consequences that being Spider-Man has on Peter Parker's personal life as he struggles between fulfilling his responsibility and going after what he wants in life, all while fighting against an eight-limbed villain consumed by his own ambitions and desire. Spider-Man 2 does things that most superhero movies today don't, and not only that, but it does them incredibly well. Danny Elfman's score, which to this day is still criminally slept on, has in my opinion the best superhero theme ever. Not just because it sounds amazing, but because it's an accurate representation of the character, which is something I believe superhero themes should strive to achieve. The start of the theme reflects Peter's humility and unassuming character. Next, his powers and the wonder behind it. Some parts of it perfectly capture the energy behind Spidey's swinging. A whole section of it is actually Doc Ock's theme, and yes, this part is different for each film. Another part emulates Spidey's perseverance and determination to save others no matter what it personally costs him. And finally, the ending, which reminds us that under the mask is a regular person with hopes, dreams, and people he loves. The fact that the theme dedicates so many parts to the different aspects of Spider-Man, from the person he is under the mask, his powers, and even his enemy, allows for moments in the film to shine even brighter. Let's take for example the part where, spoilers, Peter returns as Spider-Man after getting his powers back. Spider-Man was a hero. I just couldn't see it. Notice the music plays a variation of the part in Spidey's theme that represents his powers. He stole my suit! He's a menace to the entire city! Then when he's swinging it, plays the swinging part. And to top it all off, there's this transition to Doc Ock that's both visually and musically perfect. It's perfect. You could turn the screen off and just listen to the scene and you would still understand what's going on in the story. Another great thing about the way this movie uses the score is that since it uses it almost all the time, whether it's during a conversation, a fight, or an important character moment, the score becomes familiar and even comfortable to us as an audience whenever it plays. This makes it so that when it doesn't play during a scene, it makes us feel tense and vulnerable. Like for example in, spoilers, the hospital scene where the surgeons are trying to remove Doc Ock's arms. The lack of music in this scene makes it cold and full of dread. The image of tentacle-like mechanical arms protruding from an unconscious body as they lifelessly murder everyone in the room is more terrifying than most things I've seen in actual horror movies. It's a whole scene dedicated to making Doc Ock an actually scary villain, which again, isn't something most superhero movies ever really do. But Dr. Otto Octavius isn't just a terrifying villain for Spider-Man. There's actually a surprisingly large amount of depth to his character and he's critically important as an obstacle for Peter to overcome in this story. While the first film centered around the theme of responsibility, Spider-Man 2 is about choice, though it's not apparent from the first half of the film, which is a brilliant decision since it makes us share in Peter's belief that he has no choice. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man, given a job to do. It is his responsibility to be Spider-Man, no matter if it's at the cost of his career, 
his education. Get it done, or I'm failing you. Public perception. You've turned the whole city against him. A fact I'm very proud of. Now. His friendship. If you knew who he was, would you tell me? His living situation. You know, all I got is this 20 to the rest of the week. Ah. Sorry he doesn't pay the rent. But above all, what he wants most in life, a relationship with Mary Jane. I'm seeing somebody now. Oh. The responsibility he has been given is keeping him from doing what he wants. On the other hand, we have Dr. Otto Octavius, a genius scientist Peter has to do a report on who shares a common belief with him, that our strengths are our responsibility to use for good. Intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift and you use it for the good of mankind. He is who Peter aspires to be, someone who is both dedicated to his responsibility, but who also at the same time has the person he loves alongside him. If you keep something as complicated as love stored up inside, it can make you sick. I finally got lucky in love. But as Peter continues to lose Mary Jane due to his life as Spider-Man, he starts losing his powers. His responsibility is consuming everything in his life that he holds dear, and now it's starting to consume even himself. But Octavius isn't just what Peter wants to be, he is who Peter wants to be to an unhealthy extreme. Octavius is like an exaggerated version of Icarus. Icarus made wings, Octavius made four arms. Icarus flew too close to the sun, Octavius created it. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. But like Peter's responsibility, it too consumes everything Otto holds dear and himself, only in this case, literally. Doc Ock is a version of Peter who stops at nothing to fulfill his responsibility, a version who abandons his humanity to achieve his dream. Crazy scientist turns himself into some kind of a monster. Four mechanical arms welded right onto his body. <laughs> Guy named Otto Octavius winds up with eight limbs. What are the odds? While Doc Ock vows to fulfill his dream and proves himself to be a challenge for Spider-Man, things get even worse for Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want you all to know that the beautiful Miss Mary Jane Watson has just agreed to marry me. Him losing what he wanted most in life causes him to not only lose his powers completely, but his desire to even be Spider-Man. Maybe you're not supposed to be Spider-Man climbing those walls. You always have a choice, Peter. I have a choice. Peter starts to reevaluate his life and what responsibility means to him through an imagined conversation between him and Uncle Ben. All of those times I counted on you to have the courage to take those dreams out into the world. I can't live your dreams anymore. It's here that Peter realizes that he never really wanted to be Spider-Man, at least to this degree where it's negatively affecting his personal life. It just sort of happened to him. Up to this point, he hadn't really been doing it for himself. He had been doing it out of guilt for Uncle Ben. Take my hand, son. He never stopped to think about what he actually wanted. I want a life of my own. I'm just Peter Parker. Spider-Man. No more. In this scene, he's not giving up. He's doing the right thing. He's letting go of his guilt and becoming his own person again. Because of this, we get one of my favorite montages of all time, where he's finally able to focus on school, take it easy, and embrace himself. And the choice of music and the way it's edited, especially in the extended edition, does a fantastic job of reflecting who exactly Peter Parker is. Dorky, cheesy, but wholesome. Nothing's worrying me. And it would be a crime to not mention that the extended edition also gives us this gem. But back to the story. Peter is finally pursuing what he wants, however, he worries whether or not he's doing the right thing. He still feels the drive to help others, even powerless and at his own risk, but fears it means it will always be in the way of what he wants. While Doc Ock gets even closer to achieving his dream, Peter feels increasingly further from achieving his own. But maybe that's not so bad. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest gives us strength, even though sometimes we 
have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most. Peter tries to shift what he wants from being a life with Mary Jane to being New York's hero. I'm back! I'm back! However, that doesn't do it because he isn't being honest with himself. As noble as being a hero for the sake of others sounds, it still isn't what Peter actually wants. I want you to find your friend, Spider-Man. Tell him to meet me at the West Side Tower at three o'clock. Or I'll peel the flesh off her bones. He can't want something out of guilt, nor can he for the sake of others. He can only want something for himself. In order to get what he wants, Peter must become Spider-Man. After getting his suit back, we get one of the best action sequences in the entire genre, where the hero not only fights the villain, but saves people in the process. And I don't mean inadvertently saves some people who are off screen by just focusing on the bad guy, I mean he actually saves people. A strong focus on heroes saving people on screen is yet another thing superhero movies today just don't really do anymore. In the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, Spidey is constantly saving regular day-to-day -day New Yorkers of all ages, which makes his environment feel real and alive. Here, New York is just as much of a character as Peter, Harry, and Aunt May. Civilians aren't just there to be annoying obstacles during an action scene. They are there to lift the hero up and fully interact with him. In the end, Peter puts a stop to Doc's plan not through beating him up, but through reminding him who he is. It was my dream. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most. Even our dreams. And just like how Octavius lets go of his dream, Peter lets go of his dream too. I think I always knew. And you know why we can't be together. Spider-Man will always have enemies. I can't let you take that risk. After letting Mary Jane go, Peter is finally able to make the choice to be Spider-Man for himself. However, through letting Mary Jane go, he also gives her the freedom to make her own choice. I know you think we can't be together. Can't you respect me enough to let me make my own decision? I love you. And with that, Peter gets what he's always wanted. To live out his responsibility with the person he loves alongside him. Thanks for watching.